one. Hi, this is Reg Atwal and welcome back to our channel. For those of your loyal followers, for those of you who enjoy, if you haven't been there before, we've got many show series and today's all about family business legacies. And today we have a second generation business that we're going to do a deep dive into. And my guest today that I'll be introducing to you formally now is Mr. Samir Gupta. He's the chairman and managing director of Jackson Group which is one of India's leading distribution energy, solar, and EPC solutions companies. In fact, probably number one right now across India. I'll share a few facts later. Samir is a second generation entrepreneur. Business was founded by his father. He also works alongside his brother, which we'll talk about later as well. The business was established in 1947, 73 years old, I believe, with four manufacturing facilities now, three independent solar power plants, 40 sales offices, grown from India to Bangladesh to Nepal, Singapore, UAE, and across Africa continent, and employs now 2,200 people with five core business units serving 45,000 customers with 52 channel partners. I'll, I'll share more facts later. Samir is very active with his learning. He's also been a past chairman of the Confederation of Indian Industry, CII, I believe, in the Northern region. And he's also an alumni member of the Harvard Business School. So on that note, let's find out more about Jackson Group and the second generation family business. Please welcome to our show, Samir Gupta. Welcome. Thank you, Adwal. Thank you for such a generous introduction. A pleasure to have connected and happy to interact with you today. I really appreciate it. Well, I don't hang around with my questions, uh, Sami. I'm going to go straight in. What's it like being a second generation member working with your father? We hear a lot of case studies around the world with family businesses where people struggle, you know, next generation struggle working with their parents. Um, so tell us what, what's worked what hasn't worked, what have been some of the learnings or challenges on this journey until you've taken that baton on and now become the chairman of an MD? So uh, it has been a very interesting journey as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, fortunately, the way my father thinks is pretty different. Mm -hmm. uh, and he gave us uh, literally all the liberty to do whatever we wanted to, uh, you know, right since the beginning. Uh, I joined this business in 1990 after graduating. I did my uh, be in electronics. My brother joined after two years, mm -hmm. and uh, you know thereafter um, uh, we were deeply involved. We were both both of us were deeply into technology. We used to love traveling uh, with a purpose, with the objective of learning what's happening around the world. And uh, you know, I remember way back in uh, 1995, I guess uh, we did a homegrown ERP, which we used for a good 10 years uh, before we migrated to SAP. So that was the kind of, uh, you know, deep commitment to technology both uh, my brother and I had. Mm. Uh, and uh, somewhere somewhere in uh, year 2000, my father almost passed on the baton to us. Mm -hmm. uh, he's still involved with the engineering college, no longer with the business though. Right. Uh, and it was, I think he realized pretty uh, early that yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's it's good for the next generation to take over, uh, and uh, he didn't he didn't uh, question or look into any of our decisions thereafter ever since 2000. He did mm -hmm. he must have noticed uh, the huge commitment uh, we both had towards the business, uh, and you know uh, very early on there were quite a few learnings from him. By the way, mm -hmm. I remember uh, after graduating when I came uh, to back home to Delhi, uh, he, the first thing what he told was you know, uh, never be slave to money. And, uh, you know, money got to be byproduct of uh, right work and hard work. Right. That's something that those words are kind That's of- That's good, I like that. That's a good principle. What other principles do you think he gave to you from a young age? Because sometimes the impact that parents have on us for a family business to continue from one generation to the next, a lot of the seeds are planted the first 14 years of our life. So what other things did you observe or mimic or see uh, your father do that had an impact on you? Uh, so that's what, you know, uh, in first couple of years, I would say this was one of the things which got embedded. Uh, then uh, one of the things he always used to say, customer is king and honor all commitments. What you land up making to, to the customer, be it verbal or in writing, that's a material commitment as a commitment. And uh, there was an interesting lesson I learned, by the way, uh, after just two years of my experience working with my dad, immediately after graduating, I was working with my father. I didn't get a 
chance to you know formally work for some other company or get internship done somewhere else mm -hmm. and uh, during during this two years uh, i remember after two years of working with him i quoted for a project it was not a big project then it was just uh, you know uh, small value in, in current context not even 10000 or yeah. 15000 dollars worth of a contract and uh, when i quoted the contract or the order or the LOI came in writing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, without me following up or even visiting customer. Mm -hmm. And we had given maybe about uh, 100 US dollars equivalent as a earnest money deposit, mm -hmm. which means that if we don't honor the contract, that earnest money deposit could have got forfeited. Right. And when this purchase order came, uh, my father had a look at the value of the purchase order. He realized I've done some blunder in mm -hmm. the calculations. And uh, when he called for the file, I also quickly realized that, you know, it, it was a calculation mistake and we were into loss. So the very first order, what I quoted was turning out to be a loss making order. And my father asked me, I categorically remember, Samir, what should we be doing with this? So I said, uh, it's simple, you know, instead of losing uh, 3,000, 4,000 odd dollars, let's lose $100, uh, which is a much lesser stake. Uh, he absolutely refused to, you know, accept that. He made me execute that order. And uh, from that day on, uh, our organization is so customer centric that we go, uh, we walk as many miles as we can to exceed customers' expectations. So the one thing he has taught is customer is king. Um, and the third thing also he taught, uh, well, by the way, that was respond to every communication. Uh, those days that used to wow. be letters and telexes only. Uh, facts also came, uh, I think. Well, he, he's, he definitely gave you some really good principles, I think, that, that have stayed with you. Can I ask you, outside of the principles, th those are good learnings. But as you know, with your vast experience across India, South Asia, I mean, we work obviously across the world and we've seen with family businesses where that communication or that unity, that, that, that connectivity is not there sometimes with, with parents and the next generation. I know you haven't been through that. But what 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 uh, uh, tips could you give, based on the good things that you've been through for other families? How do you ensure that you get that relationship right between first and second generation? So I was partly coming to that actually. Great. So when he saw that these learnings, what he kind of inculcated in both of us, and we were implementing in day-to-day -day life, and he probably probably you know mm -hmm. saw us implementing those for good eight years. He gave the burden to us and. The key was the strong bond what me and my brother had always, mm -hmm. which we continue to have even till date, uh, which is foundation of our current business, which is going to be foundation for uh, next generation as well. I think I think communication is the key, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I would I would say a few things there uh, from mm -hmm. family standpoint. Uh, you know, uh, one is uh, you should have spirit of sacrificing. It should be other person first rather than. Uh, you trying to keep yourself at the front. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do that with a spirit of forgiveness, if that's there in your attitude, uh, I don't think any could anything could ever go wrong between between the family members. And secondly, is communication. Often, what happens at well is that we tend to keep uh, things close to our chest, close to our heart, and keep mm -hmm. those heart bones are generally uh, there for for years uh, together, and that generally erupts someday. And it results in separation and all that stuff, what we see in uh, most of the business families, unfortunately. Uh, I think that uh, honest communication and the environment and the framework mm -hmm. uh, which we had where uh, we were not judgmental. Nobody was judgmental. So I think that that became a strong, strong basis. And that is what is, that mm -hmm. has become a way of life for us. It is, it is now a culture for us. So that's, uh, that's the culture we have kind of formalized. And uh, now it's part of our family constitution, which is which is kind of a guiding document uh, for the next generation to come. Absolutely. Why is it difficult? We, you know, we talk about communication. We know it's important, but why do some family members with each other have difficulty in communicating with each other? Uh, so communication, as uh, I often say, by the way, in the family, it's it's not about uh, what I end up saying or what I'll end up texting or uh, sending an email. It's about what other person understands. Mm. If, if you, you can communicate by body language also without speaking anything, you're in a room and if you, you have a swollen of face, you are communicating, communicating a lot, right? So it's, it's all about what other person understands. And if you are not judgment, 
subtle to any of the emotion of the other person at that point of time uh, i think uh, you know uh, battle is kind of won and that's to mind uh, to my mind communication a uh, frank honest transparent communication without uh, judging giving mm-hmm. honest feedback being open to a honest feedback mm-hmm. as we often say even within the company by the way that feedback is a gift uh, only your well wishers can give you you know true feedback uh, not, not you've got to you've got to have some ground ground rules to make that happen yeah um and that's where i suppose the the family constitution code of conduct like we've we've done probably about 128 of those now around the world but you know for those people listening right now who don't understand what that is it doesn't always have to be a thick you know the thickest document in the world but even if it's a few pages to start off with with some basic ground rules you know what are your values what are your guiding principles would you agree because that starts the communication if you don't have the bedrock of some basic ground rules then you're also people are left with how do i seek to understand how do i openly share what i want to share with my brother or my sister or my father uh, so uh, there are no written set of ground rules but i guess yes uh, we do often talk about values in our family constitution meetings which we have once in a quarter religiously mm-hmm. um, integrity being one of those and when we say integrity it's in the context of do what you say we are trying to keep it very simple all we are saying is do what you say period and nothing else uh, secondly is about care and care uh, comes uh, in context of i would say not only empathy but uh, psychological safety uh, so that's also if if the family member could be a child could be a brother sister parents or so ever if they feel psychologically safe that you know uh, they can open out they can talk whatever they want they won't be judged uh the other person is not going to jump to any conclusion the other person is going to put himself or herself in your shoes and try to wear your hat and then think accordingly um, i i think uh, nothing can go wrong it's it's a, it's it's uh, also about you know frequent communication it's not that you land up communicating only when you have an issue mm-hmm. uh, good times bad times it got to be a way of life since years uh, me and my brother have been staying together Uh, literally together um, in the near vicinity and we make it a point since uh, i don't know how many years uh, having i mean i mean 30% of family businesses i mean you're in the 30% club you know that get to second generation obviously the numbers deep uh, go 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 down after this to 12 to whatever 15% and obviously the 3% club fourth fourth generation 100 plus year legacy I mean it gets more complex doesn't it if you by the time you take the next generation now third generation the dynamics there uh, the wealth that you've created as the second generation to support that generation has also changed um, what are your thoughts on how do you get that right with more members at third generation more spouses will come in um, male and female and they will bring their values to the table their opinions there's a whole bunch of stuff there to consider for the next gen what do you think uh, that's very interesting point you have made at well and i'll i'll bring in couple of thoughts around this uh, point what you have made uh, one is when family members get added be it spouses or whosoever uh, it's very important to put conflict on the table and keep on aligning and it is it is not a destination it's not about one conflict uh, fact remains we all have issues fact means we all have conflicts fact means we will always have difference of opinion all fingers cannot be the same but mm-hmm. thumb has a role to play and so has the little finger yeah. so we got yeah. to be seeing in a family that what is the value add or the contribution that person is making rather than trying to get into us you know pardon my what stupid comparison of uh, i am better or he is better or she is right. better once you start looking at what other person is contributing to your success uh, to your family and keeping relationship uh, as the key driver uh, then of course you land up taking the right steps so for example uh, i would say in our case very very clearly we say that uh, what is good for business mm-hmm. is good for family it's not the other way around this is one philosophy we strongly follow every family constitution meet which happens once in a quarter uh, you know one of those one of the uh, slides uh, uh, on the deck has got three or four uh philosophy bullet statements one of them is uh, what's good for uh, business is good for family and other statement we often talk about is 
equal is not always fair and fair is not always equal mm. uh, you know in the context of uh, five fingers i was talking about yeah. you know each each one of us by the way not not only brothers and sisters in a family or family members each one of us have got unique set of qualities so if you can just identify the qualities part of it mm. and see how we can support each other how we can collaborate how it can be a win win uh, by by having some kind of you know um, i would say a measurement tools also in place so that it is transparent visible known to all i think many generations can work to work together why only third why only fourth and by the way i i strongly opine uh, and sincerely opine that uh, in second in second generation of business you land up creating a lot of value and 93% of the business families all across the world which you might be also having the data i am sure do land up separating out when third or fourth or fourth generation comes in imagine the value we land up destroying by actually separating out so good work done by uh, parents and your forefathers etc uh, goes down the drain so once once this concept of protecting wealth for benefit of families benefit of communities benefit of nations benefit of generations to come if that gets clearer in next generation i think today's generation is educated enough they they have concern for society they have concern for environment uh, they believe in principles of sustainability they would work for the cause but the key is that you got to often talk about it you know uh, we we shouldn't expect ki it's going to happen automatically we, we need to keep talking we need to keep reminding can i ask you samir you mentioned something very interesting earlier about what's good for the business is good for the family um again there's no right or wrong way i think everyone's got their own philosophy as a family and their own dna way of operating but i have seen enough evidence where third fourth and and one case study in particular with a 12th generation family business where there had to there was a shift after the fourth generation where they were essentially a business family but wanted to shift to them becoming a family business and what that really meant in their eyes was around the dinner table every social gathering everything was about business it was all about business first family second and they realized as the as the family became bigger that the the shift had to happen to put family first and business second and that doesn't mean that we disregard the business there's a balance there or growth has to be there liquidity for the future reserve funds manage the welfare for the family but they had they had a huge shift to be successful to focus more on the family so sometimes people say yeah you know we 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 spend a lot of time with family but essentially the time they spend is just talking about the business around the dinner table um what are your opinions around some of the things i've said uh, so uh, my opinion and partly i would say experience also at while i would say treat business like a family and family like a business Mm-hmm. uh and there got to be all elements into it you, you know you should not be, i i won't say you can't you should not be only talking business as and when you meet there got to be a lot of commitment of time where you actually bond you crack jokes you laugh it out uh, again the key is you, so to my mind why it happens the point mm-hmm. what you made uh as and when communication is limited only for sake of business while business might come first and if success of business would keep families together which is which is the end result that's that's not the uh, that's not the path that's the uh, end goal right but at the same time if we are only communicating for reasons of uh, business then uh, we are actually not uh, sharing we are actually not caring we are actually not bonding mm. and unless and until you bond at deeper level um and you know understand other person's mindset other other person's pain uh, yeah. other person's uh, happiness right. uh, other person's uh, you know successes failures because yeah, everyone's got their own personal needs haven't they everyone's got different needs as a family member exactly exactly so that's that's not uh, to, to my mind that's not caring and i said care is a very important uh, value what uh, what we uh, 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 you know focus on so that that got to be pretty much there for keeping generations and generations to uh, be together so one of the things what we have done is uh, very interesting uh, by the way of course there has been learnings i have been reading a lot of books around a uh, family constitution meeting a lot of good old families where fourth fifth sixth generation also in this country have been working together 
uh, we have not only this family constitution what we have done as well is that uh, all our businesses uh, they are owned by trust yes so none of us are owning any shares mm. in any business so that's a journey still it's kind of work in progress but uh, the thought process is pretty clear and there's pros and, and there's uh, pros and cons there isn't there as well of having a pros and cons yes uh, everything in life will have uh, pros and cons yeah. including work from home um, but the point is uh, the culture what we have tried to create mm. is that we are custodians of wealth mm. uh, which which you know uh, when you start thinking that i am a owner at time it drives a wrong behavior vis a vis when you think you are a custodian of wealth Yes. which is to be used for a larger cause then you start looking at life slightly differently uh, so that's again um, as i said you have to keep on doing awareness sessions it's not it's not that you write a document and life is all set it doesn't happen that way mm. uh, like in our family uh, i am playing that role currently uh, hoping one of the days my brother or somebody else is going to play that role we call it ceo of the family ceo is nothing but chief emotional officer So unless and until we connect at emotional level, uh, it's 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 not going. We are hundred percent right because the research we've done the last nineteen years, we've identified uh, many emotional blockages within families. And you're right. You know, you could create your family constitution, but you could also rip it up and throw it in the bin, unless you are on a regular basis having that communication, the awareness session, like you said, and sorting out the underlying emotional blockages. because they're bound to come up there's always new ones going to come up every year uh, and we have to deal with them faster not put it under the carpet or be out of respect in our cultures because we can't speak up and talk about how we're feeling we then up, end up internalizing it and eventually that will blow up at some stage there'll be a volcanic eruption at some point exactly so i'm glad i like i like your uh, acronym of 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 ceo i think that's good we i've spent a lot of time and i've spoken uh, speaking about family we've got a couple of other questions and maybe we could shift to the business side i'm sure some of our viewers want to know more about business growth and some of the great things that jackson groups doing but what's your thoughts culture in india with daughters coming into the business or spouses allowed to work in the business what's your thoughts around some of these things which are historically a, a no go area uh, so in our case i'm i'm sharing my example Yeah. uh i have two sisters uh, they chose to be not to be part of the family business uh now my two sons are married my brother also has got two sons incidentally uh, none of us have got daughters but the daughter in laws already are part of the company oh wow excellent and in the constitution document what, what we have written down we are pretty clear that in next generation uh, we are going to treat uh, uh, both you know daughters daughter in laws son in laws everybody kind of alike so that uh, at least you know from hey well done it's a, it's about time we see more of that in in especially in india from what i've gathered over the last few decades we need a shift there i like the like the idea of having that equality within your constitution because these days uh, a lot of the female bloodline descendants and spouses in this case like you mentioned they have they have fire in their belly they have some great contribution they can give to the family business and it gives them a sense of belonging as well not on the sense of belongingness uh, the little experience since my sons got married pretty recently what i have witnessed is this very principle of equality uh, that also you know build up the bond big time very good which leads to eventually success of the family yeah i like it so again i could ask i could spend another 5 hours asking you questions on the family piece but let's talk about the business side um you know, from your father building the business and then handing over to the next gen you and your brother when was the turning point on the business side that allowed you to build such a massive conglomerate now with so many business units you know dealing with thousands of employees and tens of thousands of customers channel partners expanded globally i've seen some of the the pictures of the solar plants i mean phenomenal you know huge projects when was the turning point of of that uh-huh. growth so uh, as i said my brother and me we joined in a time frame of couple of years in 1989 and 91 respectively uh, we were a single business company then uh, mm-hmm. for good 8 years we were trying to do all crazy things in terms of uh, within our own limited uh, manner trying to do whatever innovation we could do mm-hmm. into our businesses in terms of processes if not on products 
and then in 19 uh, sorry in 2000 uh, our father he didn't retire retire he was pretty much active on the board uh, but day to day he was not involved since last 15 18 years he has not even signed the balance sheet wow. he gave that responsibility to us uh, we were just about in 2000 uh, yeah year 2000 we were just about 10 million us dollar company uh, today we are close to about uh, 350 million plus yes uh, and uh, you know touch wood a that confidence on each other between the two brothers did play a role it play a big role for us to uh, grow um, uh, and you know uh, i remember again uh, one of the olden days i did ask my father what is the basis of taking a decision in the company and we both were sitting we were having dinner together and what he said was there is only one basis that is that decision going to benefit company or not in the process you will do mistakes Mm. Uh, that's why we call it profit and loss account we don't call it a profit account <laughs> exactly what some of the biggest mistakes that that, that you've made uh, that you've learned lots from on, on your business journey uh, so uh, i'll come to uh, uh, that in a, in a sec so sure. you would lose money you would make money but there got to be learnings mm. and if you can ensure that you don't repeat the same mistake again um, the, the the mistakes are worth it Mm-hmm. and there is no individual to my mind i would be knowing who has not done mistakes that's right so so you know this is what happened in 2000 uh, in year 2000 everything was going fine we did our own share of mistakes in 2008 9 came lehman brother crisis uh, which was a global crisis uh, our business revenues fell straight away by 30% in a short span of you know one and a half years mm-hmm. uh, we didn't knew what to do we were sitting on a high fixed cost uh you know we started uh, partly losing money uh, mm-hmm. for a short while though that is the time that was a learning again you know that, that was the time we decided that we will not put all the eggs in one basket yes. uh, we kind of hired one of the big fours without naming the big fours uh, and did a strategy session for two years it mm-hmm. ran for good two years to identify what core competency of the company was and then we figured out that yes we would get into solar and epc simultaneously mm-hmm. uh, this was a decision we took back in 2012 right. uh, where our revenues were just uh, what uh, close to maybe 100 million us or 120 million us in 2010 and uh, once once we started diversifying again during the process of diversification there were sets of mistakes we did in terms of processes in terms of people uh, in terms of structures um and we continue to learn so i i would say that till such time you are open to learn mm-hmm. uh, open to reflect um and it's a never ending process by the way not that uh, you do some kind of uh, few courses or read few books so uh, can i ask you sir just to come in all, all the areas that you've expanded into has there been a link you know i understand the history of the company you know getting into so i'm not a te- technical person like you in your industry but diesel genset is that right and then sort of moving into solar and then getting into epc and for those who don't know epc if it's new to engineering procurement and construction solutions and then i noticed when i was doing some research on your website that what's this new area hybrid solutions what what's all that about <laughs> i'm glad that you have browsed to it it's of course hybrid solution is again it's more on around uh, figuring out a solution where partly it's fossil fuel partly it's storage partly it's renewable mm-hmm. uh, uh, right i am trying to explain it in a layman's language partly it's combination of you know how you can optimize your fuel so that cost gets optimized and you are also able to focus on sustainability as well as environment uh, so this climate change is going to uh, drive a very different behavior in times to come by regulators by Uh, CEOs by businesses by governments all over the world and we will see this transition happening towards uh, fuels which are not uh, polluting the environment got it um, it it could be biofuels it mm. could be you know synthetic fuels uh, it could be hydrogen as a storage it could mm. be lithium ion as a storage solution a lot of technologies are being worked upon uh, mm. so hybrid is 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 as a broader term used to Uh, used to kind of uh, uh, define what kind of technology you want to use in what proportion to solve energy problem of the other uh, person so that's that's what it's all about you, you you've come a long way haven't you from that diesel type business 
$10 million business to now $350 million business. So what, what are the lessons there for people listening right now where sometimes, you know, they're stuck to their core business for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're not embracing change. They're not embracing innovation. I see this time and time again with family businesses who are stuck and they're not prepared to take that risk and step forward with both feet and go, right, let's do this. You know, why is that? So, uh, you rightly said it, Adval, by the way, change is the only constant. And if you don't change your or reinvent your business model, mm -hmm. uh, I would say have that agility and keep on reviewing it in a timely manner. Uh, a day would come where it's going to die down or, or might become insignificant, if not dying down. Uh, so, what we, at least in our company, what we do is we have a group of people who keep on focusing on future. Mm -hmm. uh, as we talk, we are by the way even right. focusing on what we should be doing five years out or ten years out. Yes. Uh, so we we know uh, we could you know sense it that while we talk of diesel, right? While generating sets are going to stay, uh, fuel might change for that matter. Mm -hmm. It's it's about polluting fuel. It's it's not about the equipment uh, per se. Mm -hmm. uh, storage would come in as I was talking about. So so the point I want to make is that you've got to be focusing on your current business, which is pretty stable, giving you stable returns. Uh, you've got to be focusing on horizon two, as we say, uh, which is going to give you returns over next five, seven years. It is, it's going to generate cash. And there got to be a group of people who is just focusing into future. Uh, that may not be giving you revenue today. That won't give you profit today. It might be only cost. But at some point of time, that's going to con uh, convert into both revenue and profit. Uh, and by the way, that can only happen. Uh, not only that, uh, you you kind of need to be innovating, focusing uh, on future. Uh, it's it's all about having right people. You know, uh, recently, yeah. my brother and myself, as I said, learning is a continuous process. Uh, brother and myself, we did an executive uh, course from Harvard, uh, as recent as maybe three years back or four years back. And one of the great learnings was, uh, you know, uh, people come first followed by processes because people make processes, processes don't make people. Followed by planning and performance. So four P's is what uh, we often talk about in this company also now. And it gives so much of clarity that last few years, ever since both of us have done this course uh, from Harvard, mm -hmm. we are just focusing on people and, you know, uh, working on not only skill set, but having people whose values are aligned with us. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I like the idea. First of all, I think again, for the viewers, build your future team in parallel with your existing team. I think that is a huge lesson right there. And I think uh, getting, I totally agree with you about values. You know, we've seen many people in organizations over the years, Samir, who, you know, they, they, they perform, but you can see there's conflict. They're not aligned with values. So maybe you can expand a bit more. Why are values so important? So values, uh, uh, of course, are pretty important. It is, first of all, your business values got to be having uh, some correlation with your personal values or family values, right? Uh, when we talk of our business, we, we did a session where leadership team was all, also involved, spent good two days on offsite brainstorming as to what it means to us, you know, what really uh, excites us, what we are passionate about in terms of values, not about the business or performance. And, you know, we, we came out with five, uh, clear five uh, values. Uh, it's about integrity, customer centricity, innovation, teamwork, and care. Integrity, as I said, is pretty mm -hmm. simple. Uh, it's, it's not the dictionary meaning. We are saying sure. that honor your, do what you say, you know, just honor your commitment. If you, if you make a promise to any of your colleagues, uh, just ensure it happens in a timely manner. Customer mm -hmm. centricity, centricity for us is exceeding customer's expectation. And when I say customer, it is both internal and external. It's not limited to just... Uh, you know, external set of customers, what we generally uh, get confused about. Innovation, again, is uh, being creative. It's, it's doing something different. I remember I was fortunate to be a part of that uh, program, which was Champions of Change. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was uh, hosted by Honorable Prime Minister of India. And uh, his comment was that uh, without innovation, there is going to be stagnation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, again, it's about way of life. It's not about product alone. We often get confused that when we talk about innovation, it got to be on the product. Innovation can be in any part of any part of your life, the way you live, the way you eat, the way you drink, the way you, uh, you know, conduct anything for that matter. 
and teamwork again is the next value which is very important to us teamwork for us is uh, at least to me i always think that how can i contribute to you know success of the other person to me that is teamwork uh, and that that eventually uh, results into a whole uh, lot of collaboration and finally it's uh, care care is is very close to our hearts we really mean it so it's beyond empathy it's about these are the uh, values that you integrate with with the key team yeah can i ask you some maybe you know, I know you've got a very, very successful business, you know, one of the leading companies in India and expanding globally. But with this year right now, 2020, with the pandemic situation and COVID-19, there are many small to medium-sized enterprises as family businesses that are suffering right now, bleeding. Some of them won't make it this year, unfortunately, um, which is very sad. So anyone who's listening right now, it doesn't matter what size their business is, but is really suffering with the pandemic situation. What what tips would you give them if you were in there right now with them and looking at their business? What could be one, two, three, four things that they should consider doing to at least make sure that that family business has a chance to see 2021? I think the single biggest tip uh, I would give from business standpoint, I'm not uh, talking of other tips, is to conserve resources. Mm -hmm. And resources is not only about you know finances, it's about human resources, you would be having good assets, uh, good people in the company. Uh, secondly is, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, I will say collaborate by communication, uh, empathize with your people, understand their personal issues. We are all going through uh, emotional wreck, most of us mm -hmm. in COVID days due to different reasons. Reasons could be very different for a small business, reasons could be a different for employee it could be different for a large business uh, it could be a different reason altogether but we are all going through emotional break yes. uh, and uh, unless and until we have a you know uh, we channelize this energy and we share uh, uh, we we won't be able to come out of this uh, uh, bondage so um, all i'm trying to say is that it's it's all about connecting with people be it a small industry or a large industry uh, and sharing of the emotions uh, that can certainly uh, solve the purpose uh, to, to my mind. Conserving all the resources, focusing on health, that is obviously the first priority currently. Uh, this is the time one can actually reflect uh, reflect back into his whatever number of years, see how he can take forward his learnings uh, for future. Mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly what we did. Uh, I think one has realized in last three, four months or six months, uh, that life is not only about what you are doing today. It's about the higher cause. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, think beyond yourself, beyond your family. You have to think about society. You have to think about nation. Mm -hmm. um, I have spent a lot of time reading in the last uh, six months, uh, particularly spirituality. Prior to that, I was focusing more on uh, leadership and, you know, business related books. And uh, something which uh, in my head is pretty clear after reading a lot on spirituality in the last six months is, you know, uh, Keep your desires in control. And if you're able to do that, uh, you will have enhanced uh, pleasure, happiness, satisfaction. You know, one, of, one of the equations, very interesting, Athal, uh, one of the books what I was reading, it said, man minus desires is equal, in, is equal to God. Uh, we can't be God, but we can definitely minimize our desires and keep them in a band uh, so that uh, we are you know, not uh, endlessly uh, running after uh, pleasures or uh, so-called perceived happiness by running after objects or persons. So uh, this has been a learning kind of a learning over last six months. So yeah. I think... Uh, I, I, appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. There's some, good, there's some good points you've made there. I appreciate that. And whoever's watching, you know, watch the video again, watch the episode again, and maybe take on board some of Samir's uh, uh, comments there. Uh, let's go into the future for a second for Jackson Group, for you personally, your family, uh, projecting out to uh, December 31st, 2030. Yeah. 2030. Okay. Yeah. 10 years in the future. And for those of you watching in 2020, and uh, hopefully there's people watching this right now in 2030. Thank you. And we'll see whether this ha has happened or not. So talk us through, you know, we're together December 31st, 2030. I'm congratulating you saying well done to the Gupta family, fantastic job, Jackson Group. But what's happened, looking back? Thank you, Atwal. I'm already excited to hear this from you, first of all. <clears throat> so uh, you know, at least in my head, uh, I, I have already kind of, along with my brother, 
uh, taken responsibility of creating an institution of this uh, out of this family owned business and even trying to create an institution for the family as well uh, so that it remains till eternity knowing well that i am going to be around for limited number of years mm -hmm. and so are going to be most of us but this company this brand what has been created with lot of hard work of family god years should survive till eternity so that's that's the whole objective so in terms of our strategy uh, as i said we, you know, as you were also mentioning in the beginning we have currently five businesses potential is huge uh, we are in, as we talk uh, despite covid we will be land, launching some new products in the month of october mm -hmm. uh, which are related to by the way hybrid body we were talking about we call it as <clears throat> energy storage solution that's what we intend to launch within within a month that's great uh, that futuristic products uh, we are talking about also as i said uh, what could be the possible storage solution which will contribute to you know self reliant india uh, because we don't have enough uh, deposits of lithium and either we will still remain dependent so those are some of the technologies we are talking about currently we are, we are having revenues of almost about as i said close to 400 between 350 to 400 million us dollars mm -hmm. uh, very clearly very clearly if it could be five years if not four mm -hmm. we will be doubling the revenues very clearly uh, we would be 1 billion plus uh, within within next 3 to 4 years and within 10 years 2030 when we will meet before that also by the way not that we will be meeting yeah. all that <laughs> for sure for sure <laughs> yeah you know, we'll wait till we can jump on planes again and uh, not have to go on two weeks quarantine i'll, I'll be there So, so there is no number in the head. We just have this number for next three to five years. But whole objective is to create a sustainable organization which will live for times to come. It's not only about the top line. It's about by focusing on values, focusing on sustainability, mm -hmm. how we can continue to grow profitably, so that we can effectively contribute to, uh, you know, all the stakeholders, which includes yeah. family, includes employees, includes again society, vendors. Financer, so on and so forth. So, so whole objective is to work towards creating. Yeah, it sounds it sounds exciting. There's a lot to do there, and uh, wish you all the best in making that happen. Can I ask you on a personal level, you know, whether it's four hundred million dollars, a billion dollars, or some families I've worked with at five, six billion dollars? It's all numbers. You get to some point, it's all numbers, okay? And when it comes to wealth creation for the family. Um, once you've got your bucket list as they call it or your goal list of the things that you want to do or have you don't really need a lot of money after you get to a certain point i mean you're only going to be in you can only ever be in one yacht at a time or being one home at a time and some people are driven by you know they're going to be on the front cover of forbes or fortune and be in the the top 100 billionaire rich list while there's others around the world that are now driven by okay you know we're going to keep growing keep be keep being profitable keep innovating but we're driven by something else whether it's social impact or or pledging our wealth into a foundation and doing good around the world what are your thoughts around that wealth situation when you do become a billion dollar plus organization and your children and your grandchildren are going to be part of that what happens with wealth Uh, so two clear things um, uh, at least both brother and you are very clear on this uh, this wealth and yachts and you know, planes don't excite us at all by the way yeah. uh, we are very simple people uh, very simple living uh, though very high thinking very aspirational also we have of course a lot of dreams uh, but it is not that those dreams will make us uh, drive or take wrong direction so we want to slow and steady wins the race is the uh, fundamental we believe in um, i think in my head you know csr philanthropy is way of life we will keep doing it to best of our ability <clears throat> whether it you may call it csr you may call it empathy you may call it care whatever word we may give to it in our own ways we will keep on doing it but to my mind it's uh, at least in my lifetime athal uh, i would define my success as keeping my family together and continue to have that bonding uh, with all in within my family including next genera generation and the previous one if i am able to achieve that effectively i think uh, i am i'm going to be pretty happy in my life nice answer you didn't really answer my question but you did okay but but i like it i like it it's good because you you absolutely right if any of you get a chance go to the description area all the details are there for jack jackson group go and check out the company 
find out more about what Samir and his brother are doing right now. And, and you're absolutely right, Samir. There's a lot of good things you already done, whether it's called social impact or CSR. It's already part of your culture at Jackson Group. So, you know, congratulations. It's not like you're aspiring to get there. You're already doing it and you'll probably just end up doing more of it uh, as you create that wealth. W one last question, just, just as we start to wrap up. Everyone goes on their own journey in life and you get to a point in life where there's things that you know that you don't know and there's things that you know that you know, okay? What are those one or two things that you absolutely know that you know based on business and growing a business and getting it right? What last piece, piece of wisdom can you share with us and the viewers so there's a bit of take-home value from this episode? What are the things that you know that you know based on your business journey? So that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, I would say uh, be very clear on your objective. If, if you are very clear on your objective, uh, just uh, have that passion to uh, keep on pursuing it for a cause. It can't be for self gain. If it is for self gain, that means you lack clarity on your objective. So if that objective is clear, generally, most of the times, um, while there could be hurdles in the journey, uh, but you know, uh, outcome is going to be good to my mind. Uh, again, that's that's uh, a sharing of an experience. Uh, business again, business and money is all a byproduct. Uh, Athal, as I keep saying, um, and what I don't know, I think uh, I don't know nothing in the sense uh, there is so much to learn. It's crazy. Yeah. The more you hear, the more you read. Uh, these days, uh, one hour in the morning every day religiously with thanks to COVID. Uh, I, I listen to spiritual discourses and with every discourse you land up, uh, land up uh, picking something new, which, uh, which kind of, you know, hits you, strikes you. Uh, so I don't think in this lifetime, uh, at least I will be able to say, I can't comment about nobody else. I don't think I will be able to say that. Yes, I know everything. I, it's impossible. Uh, at least in I my like case. It. It's I like it. Well, I like the first response, which is about being really clear on the objective. I think these days, uh, there's a lot of confusion and when there's more than in your case two three family members large family groups there is a lot of disalignment because everybody has a different view on what the objective objective should be what the vision should be what should we do with the business you know it reminds me many years ago being in a room where three family members are in the room one, one saying I want to build a billion dollar company the second one says no 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 we just want steady growth be highly profitable look after the welfare for the family, we're good. And the third one is the next gen member going, well, I don't even want to be here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's one thing is about your own objective, but I, I believe there also has to be alignment for, for the family to grow together and continue on that journey. Otherwise you have got people going in different directions and that's why we see so many families split, you know, around the world. And obviously we want to avoid that with all the, uh, clients and, and as well as great case studies like yours to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but on that note, is there anything else you'd like to share before we close off? Any other uh, words in conclusion? Not really. Um, wonderful uh, interacting with you. Um, again, uh, to sum up, I would say objective in life is very, very important. It's not about what you acquire in your lifetime. It's uh, what about? Uh, it's all about what you share in lifetime. Mm. So you keep on acquiring the hell what you want, but at the same time, if you keep on sharing, also I think uh, you could could be a lot more happy, satisfied uh, soul. So that's that's the only thing I would say. Uh, pleasure Beautiful. interacting, and we yeah. I do definitely look forward to meet you sometime in person as well. Yeah, we look forward to. We really appreciate you taking the time out to do this. Uh, so, Mr. Samir Gupta, Chairman and Managing Director of Jackson Group, second generation member. You've heard about the story of this great family and what they're doing. Don't forget to hit, go down to the description area, hit the like button if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube or on LinkedIn, and don't forget to find out more about Jackson Group. All the details are below, and hopefully you get a chance to connect directly with uh, Samir and the family as well if you feel there's an opportunity for some alliances or maybe there is a new channel partner opportunity here with the group. I'm sure Samir will be open-minded to find out more about what could be on the table. So on that note, thank you very much, Samir, one last time. God bless you and uh, we'll catch up again soon.
Thank you so, so much. Thank you.